Hello and welcome to China Focus. I'm Shelley Zhang. Hugo Chavez, the leader of Venezuela, died on March 5th. And that's a big deal not just for Venezuela, but for China as well. China is Venezuela's second largest trading partner. So what does the death of Chavez mean for China? Joining us today via Skype from Beijing is Matt Furchin. He's the head of the China and the Developing World Program at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So could you describe a little bit the relationship between uh, China and Venezuela? Sure. It's mostly based on a sort of set of mutual interests around oil. Uh, since at least the, the late 1990s, uh, China has become a major player uh, in the Venezuelan oil market. Uh, and when Chavez became president uh, in 1998, uh, he was very interested in diversifying the uh, trade partners uh, that Venezuela had, uh, in particular, uh, in an effort to diversify away from a reliance uh, on the United States. So over time, and especially over the last decade, uh, the, the, the uh, investment and trade relationship uh, related to oil uh, has, has been the centerpiece of the relationship. So you say Chavez was interested in diversifying away from the U.S., so has he been, uh, was he the prominent pusher of this relationship with China? Yeah, I think it actually uh, was of mutual interest uh, for Venezuela. Again, uh, Chavez had had interest, in, again, in this diversification, but also uh, China served a purpose for him because as a socialist country uh, and uh, China was, was seen as a, as a potential ideological partner for Chavez as well. That was an interest that he had. China was unwilling to really reciprocate with that ideological aspect, but China, uh, since the early 1990s, has been a net importer of oil, uh, and for the last decade plus, uh, has been pursuing actively uh, trying to also diversify its sources of oil imports, and Venezuela uh, was was key part of that strategy. So do you think that Chavez's death is going to uh, have a big impact on that relationship between the two countries? It certainly has a potential. Uh, I think it's already having an impact. In fact, it started before he died. Just the, the uncertainty surrounding his health and who is in charge of the country. So really, Chavez has been someone who has had almost complete control, personal control, uh, over the levers of power in Venezuela uh, you know, for well over a, over a decade. And oil and his control over the state oil company has been a key part of that. And again, China has been a, a key partner in that relationship. And so with Chavez removed from the picture, there's just a great deal of uncertainty about who's in control and who China can even talk to uh, about who it's, who it's going to partner with on the Venezuelan side. So Chavez has had had cancer, or at least we kn had known about it since about 2011. Do you think that Chinese leadership was looking at this with some kind of contingency plan, thinking, you know, what happens if he died in office? I think certainly the, the Chinese side has uh, been knowledgeable about his health condition uh, and has been thinking about who it is that may be in uh power after, after Chavez. But for all of that consideration, I think that's still a bit shocking to have him have him gone uh, from, from the picture. And the fact is, he has been a very polarizing figure. Uh, and so with Chavez uh, gone from the picture, uh, it, it's unclear who it is uh, that's going to be able to sort of take his place. And with China having been sort of allied with, with Chavez, it's unclear who uh, they're going to be able to cooperate with uh, after uh, after Chavez has left the scene. So I want to ask you a little bit more in detail about uh, the kind of economic relationship between the two countries. Now, China Development Bank has given about $42 billion in loans to Venezuela um, in the last few years. So how do those loans work? Well, the loans have been built up over time. So that $42 billion figure uh, is probably one that is dated to about 1995 uh, when the China Development Bank really became actively involved in giving out these loans. So there have been a series of loans of different size, the largest one somewhere in the range of, of $20 billion. 
And these are uh, oil for, for loans, um, loans for oil deals in, in which uh, China has, has lent money and the way which Venezuela has paid uh, is through sales uh, and exports of, of oil. So this oil is going um, kind of directly to China? Well, this is something, the general impression is that that's the case. Uh, however, in my research, what I've found is that, in fact, uh, a significant portion, at least a third, uh, but I think probably more, of the oil is actually being resold by China. Uh, they're just a geographic uh, and, and uh, refining challenges that make it uh, economically unfeasible uh, for the oil to actually be shipped to China and refined in China. So much of it's um, being resold, likely uh, in the Caribbean and in the Gulf Coast area. So if the oil is being resold, the money is then going to the uh, state-run oil firms? That is the, 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 the best uh, guess we, we probably have. It's unclear. This is a part of the, the issue is there is an opacity uh, to the deals, uh, and it's really difficult to know. Um, so it, it's possible that the money, uh, the proceeds from oil resales are flowing back to China and into some sort of you know, public funds, but it's also possible that the firms uh, are, are using the, these, these proceeds uh, for their own purposes. It's just really mm -hmm. unclear. So if kind of like the conventional wisdom about the relationship between China and Venezuela is that China wants the oil from Venezuela, so if that you know, oil is actually part of its being resold and not actually being used uh, to ch in China, is that, does that mean that it's not actually as that in, a vital of a relationship? Well, I think it's complicated. Part of this is that these are state-owned enterprises, state-owned banks uh, on the Chinese side. So their behavior, even if they're sort of acting in their own corporate interests, seeking profit, their behavior is seen as the Chinese government's behavior. So this is a, a really tricky thing, uh, and it's part of a wave uh, of, of Chinese outbound foreign direct investment uh, that is quite confusing uh, in the sense of, is it private, is it public? Uh, so I do think that China uh, is going to continue to be interested as a matter of energy security in diversifying its sources uh, of oil imports, and Venezuela will continue to be an interest. But there is a real question of how the Chinese central government is going to try to govern its own firms to ensure that the oil actually flows back to China and that its firms don't get the country involved in diplomatic headaches. So do you think that then that the, the kind of relationship between Venezuela and China is much more economic than political? Certainly for Chavez, he wanted it to be both. It was deeply political for him. Uh, China has really been uh, leery of, uh, sort of interfering or seen as interfering or being overtly political in what China refers to as America's backyard, so the, the region uh, of Latin America and the Caribbean. So China diplomatically has been extremely cautious and has not wanted this uh, relationship to be politicized. And yet what you have is the China Development Bank uh, being very uh, interested in having a relationship, uh, an economic relationship. Would you say that kind of this type of relationship um, where the China goes and loans to a country that has natural resources that um, they are interested in, that there's a mutual economic benefit, it's China done with this with other countries in the region? This is a pretty unique relationship in the region. Uh, in part because of the unique features of Venezuela itself. Now, it's similar to other relationships in the region because of the commodity-based nature. For instance, China has become a major purchaser of iron ore from Brazil, soybean from uh, Brazil uh, and, and Argentina, and copper from Chile. So there is a commodity-based relationship with other countries in South America in particular. However, uh, the oil relationship and the, the fact that you have really sort of one person, a uh, sort of populist, semi-autocratic leader uh, like Chavez in a place like Venezuela really makes the relationship a, a little bit different. 
Now, you had mentioned in, a, in an article you wrote for The Diplomat last year the kind of the risks of China's relationship with Hugo Chavez and uh, mentioned specifically what had happened recently in Libya uh, with the regime change there and in Burma where the kind of new leadership seems to be turning more away from China and towards the U.S. Do you see uh, kind of like that dif a difference since then in how China is treating these other countries it deals with? So part of that is the question, is there a learning process taking place? Uh, because it's, it's relatively clear that the experiences with, uh, in Libya and then in, in Myanmar or Burma uh, have been relatively traumatic for China uh, in economic terms and also in political and reputational terms with those countries uh, sort of turning away from sort of close partnership with, with China. We don't know yet what's going to happen in Venezuela, but it certainly has that potential, and it has the potential to be upsetting to China, even if it's just uh, in, in reputational terms. Given how open Chavez was uh, and how friendly he was with China, there is a chance uh, that, that the new leadership, whoever it is, uh, may temper the, the, that closeness and at the very least be open to sort of uh, making relations with the United States, in particular, more normalized. So let me ask, kind of, Venezuela isn't the only kind of state that um, China has been getting oil from that has like a problematic political background like Iran and Sudan. Do you think that um, China is going to be in trouble in the next few years if, you know, similar things happen with those countries that, you know, China, because they've always said non-interference in kind of internal affairs in the country, so they haven't really cared so much about the political situation in the particular countries they've been dealing with economically. Yeah, I think this is a major challenge of Chinese diplomacy and foreign policy in general. Uh, there is uh, too much, I think, reliance on uh, state-owned enterprises that go out and do deals in the name of things like uh, energy security, but that, in fact, lead China into what I think are unnecessary uh, foreign policy headaches. So I think this is an area where the Chinese leadership which tends to be very much focused on domestic issues, really starts, needs to start thinking uh, a little bit uh, more carefully about the foreign policy implications uh, of these kinds of relationships. That said, uh, the United States and other countries have faced similar problems in the past, and it's not clear that there is an easy solution to this, especially when you're dealing with countries where you have uh, relatively closed political systems but that are that are resource rich. Uh, I think you know that's the case uh, in countries like like Iran or Sudan, and, and then in Venezuela. Okay, great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Matt, and talking about this issue. Sure. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching. For more on this and other issues in China, join us at ntd.tv.